Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. We're excited to be here with you. I'm Anna Heck and we're here with uh, Dr. Zachary Wong, Dr. Megan Milbrath, and Dan Wines. And we are here to talk about beekeeping here in Michigan, seasonal management, and answer your questions. All right, so we, we all work with MSU Extension. MSU Extension is open to everyone. Today, what we have planned is that I'll talk about some announcements and ways that you can communicate with us. Megan's going to talk about late season nectar flows and fall feeding. Dan is going to talk about different kinds of feeders you can use. Zach is gonna talk about feeding honeybees and a resource. Um, we're gonna all talk about varroa mites and then we'll have lots of time to answer your questions. So to get us started on some announcements, um, if you are watching this webinar live, you'll be able to find some of the links that we're sharing in the chat box of the Zoom application. If you're watching this as a recording on YouTube or on the MSU Extension website, you'll be able to find a list of links in the description box. Uh, we have a, a YouTube channel. It's the Michigan State University Beekeeping YouTube channel. We've been posting all of the recordings from our webinars this year. Um, so we have April, May, June, and July all posted on the YouTube channel. Uh, so the most recent webinar recording that we posted was the July uh, Michigan Beekeeping Office Hours webinar. And we'll plan to post the recording from tonight on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, we always uh, like to encourage beekeepers to think about their local beekeeping clubs. The Michigan Beekeepers Association is our statewide organization. And on their website, they have a list of local Michigan bee clubs. These bee clubs oftentimes meet monthly and work really hard to try to support beekeepers, share information, especially around local resources and environments for and how that affects beekeeping. So if you're not already part of a bee club, we highly encourage you to check one out. And another thing to think about too, is if you are someone who removes honeybee colonies from structures. So for example, if a honeybee colony establishes in the siding of someone's house or barn, and you have the bee and construction um, skills to be able to remove those colonies, we are looking to help Michigan Beekeepers Association add to its list of people who do cutouts. So the Michigan Beekeepers Association maintains a list of people who do cutout removals. You don't need to be a member of MBA in order to be added to the list, um, but you do need to send an email to our MBA newsletter editor. And so there's information on MBA's website. There's also information on the screen about how you can email someone to be added to the list. This is a time of year where we're getting lots and lots and lots of uh, questions and concerns from the public around cutouts. Uh, we know some of them aren't always necessarily honeybees. Sometimes people confuse wasps and honeybees, uh, but there are people who have honeybee colonies that are established that are looking to find hire someone as a service to remove them. And one thing for you, if you do cut out removals and you're just getting too many calls about um, wasps, you can also direct people to use the ask extension form to confirm whether or not the insects are honeybees or wasps, and then have them contact you back, contact you back if they're confirmed to be honeybees. All right, our website is pollinators.msu.edu. And we have a list of upcoming events on the website. Uh, so you can find that on the events tab. There's also a QR code and a shortened URL link there. And I'm going to go through some of our upcoming events that we are excited about. Uh, so we have two more of our office hour webinars scheduled. So one is just our general one for September, which will be September 18th at 7 p.m. And then we also have a special one that we're doing with Dr. Megan Milbrath and Dr. Peter Fowler on European Thalbird. And so that will be on Thursday, October 12th. And they are going to talk a little bit about their research and what they know about European Thalbirds. So that's a special one that we added recently. And then we also are hosting the Michigan Beekeepers Association's fall conference, pre-conference webinars. So we have two speakers lined up. Uh, one will be uh, Cybele Preston, who is the Maryland, she works with the Maryland Department of Ag, and she's going to talk about her inspection program. Uh, some of you may have read articles about her. She uh, has trained dogs to be able to smell American fiber disease, and she puts them in the little adorable bee suits, and they go around and smell for American fiber. So we're super excited to hear her webinar. That will be on Monday, October 2nd at 7 p.m. Eastern. 
it will not be recorded. So make sure that if you want to uh, see this webinar that you join us live. And then the other pre-conference webinar that we have is uh, by Dr. Katie Lee from the University of Minnesota Bee Lab on top tips for Northern beekeepers. And that will be held on Wednesday, October 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern. It will not be recorded. So again, please be sure to join us live. Dr. Katie Lee is also going to be the keynote speaker at our live conference, um, which will be held on October 21st, our fall Michigan Beekeepers Association conference. So you'll get to hear a taste of her presentations at our pre-conference webinar. These webinars that we're doing are free, but we're asking people to consider becoming a member of Michigan Beekeepers Association and or making a donation to the organization. We added these webinars to the same link as that you're using for tonight's webinar for the Michigan Beekeeping Office Hours webinar series. So if you're already watching us live and you're, you're signed up, then you'll be able to already have the link for these upcoming webinars. All right, and then our in-person meeting is on Saturday, October 21st in Claire, Michigan, and that's our fall conference with Dr. Katie Lee as a keynote presenter. All right, so again, if that, I just talked about a lot of events. They're all listed on the website. You can also get an email. It comes out about every other week with upcoming events if you sign up for our News Digest by going to pollinators.msu.edu and then clicking Stay Connected and signing up for the Pollinators and Pollination News Digest from Michigan State University Extension. Anna, All there, right. is, there is a question about the October 11th live webinar. If people are registered for this series, will they automatically get a link to that? Yeah, so it should, they'll, it'll be the same link that you're using for tonight's webinar. Great question. Um, so that's, we just added more webinars to the same series. So you're already registered, you should still, get reminder emails uh, the day before and an hour before the webinar as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so if you're watching us live, we hope that you ask your beekeeping questions. You can do so by using the Q&A box with your Zoom control. So type in your question and we'll look forward to it, addressing it. If you have questions outside of this webinar, you can feel free to use our ask extension form. And you can find that at pollinators.msu.edu slash questions. And with that, we're going to get started with late season nectar flows and fall feeding. And I'll turn it over to Megan. All right. Thanks, Anna. So um, there are a couple really busy times of year, and this feels like it can be one of them. So you can go ahead. And the main message with this one is that somebody has to be feeding your bees at this time of year. Um, and it's very, very important because one is we're about to go into a period where we don't have food anymore. And two, this is when your winter bees are getting formed. So this is a really important time that you absolutely don't want to be having nutritional stress. And the reason that I worded it as either Mother Nature provides food or you do is because in a lot of the state, we do have a secondary honey flow. I have a picture here of goldenrod. Um, this is one of my favorite goldenrods. I believe this is Riddell's goldenrod. And then if you've got a lot of goldenrod and you have good weather and you have strong enough hives to go get them, you maybe are pulling in a lot of food. If you don't, you maybe will have to feed and it can be gallons. Um, so I've been keeping bees in Michigan for, I think, well, I've been here for over 10 years and about a third of the time where I am in Jackson County, I feel like I get a pretty strong goldenrod flow and I can actually make honey. I've brought wax this time of year when it's been really strong. About a third of the time I've had like a trickle. So they're technically getting fed, but they're not putting on a ton of weight. And a third of the time I've gotten nothing. Um, where I am, it almost is reliably the peak goldenrod flow in the first week of September. And it looks like we're on track for that. But it does differ, especially with, you know, whether or not it rains this week will um, make a big difference, which where I am, it's not scheduled to. Or things like if you have a really, really hot July, the plants can not put out a lot of nectar. So it's not just that you see the blooms, but that, that you have the foraging weather and that the plants are not feeling stressed so they'll put it out. And the best way to know whether or not your bees are actually bringing it in is to you know pay attention to what you see blooming, but then also to check in your hives. And 
if you, you know, if you don't have a very strong flow coming in, this would be the time that you would start feeding. Um, so we're finishing taking honey off this week at MSU. And then the next thought would be to, to start feeding if we have to. And what you have to do is you have to account for the needs that the bees have at this time of year, plus for them to bring storage. So um, we want to make sure that we're feeding a lot because if you watch, like if you put your hives on a scale and maybe you put a gallon on them, you'll watch that scale, you know, you'll see this, the number go up with the weight when you put the bucket on and then they'll eat it back down. And maybe they're using so many resources because the colony is so big that they just ate that whole bucket. So they didn't store any of it. And then you'll put another bucket on and you'll see the weight go up and it'll go down, but maybe just a little bit higher. And it may be three or four or even five gallons before they've actually put enough um, honey away or enough syrup away to, to actually make it through. Um, so you do need to make sure, again, you know, I have 70 pounds on this scale, which is kind of considered a recommendation, but that is really, really going to be dependent on the size of the colony and on, you know, how much food is, is already in the colony. So if you have a full super of capped honey, or sorry, a full like deep box of capped honey, you maybe don't need to feed a ton. Um, if your colony feels pretty light when you lift it up from the back, you may be needing to try to get a lot of food in there. I'm going to the next one. So this is where we are a lot at this time of year where we've got lots of capped brood and we want to actually take that frame and make it look like the next frame where we have it backfilled. So we don't want to fill, um, we are going to, the bees are going to naturally shut down brood production at this time of year as you know, they form that last generation of bees and we do want that brood nest to backfill. So May and June, backfilling is just the worst. That's what leads to swarming. That makes the colony feel super overcrowded. That's kind of the worst thing we can have. And then all of a sudden, you know, October, backfilling sounds fantastic because we want that colony to really have, you know, all of the space that we leave them in to be totally um, filled, well, not totally filled, but pretty much totally filled with honey. So in the spring, backfilling bad, this time of year, backfilling is starting to be the thing we're actually aiming for. And then you also want to make sure that it takes a lot of time to dry and ripen honey, especially, you can click ahead, um, especially when it is starting to get cold. So the bees have to go into that bucket or into that feeder and pull it down one tiny sip at a time. And even if you're mixing it up two to one, that process takes a really long time. So even though it feels, especially, you know, next week it's going to get hot and it's going to feel like we're very far away from winter. If you were to wait until the temperature cools, you're just not going to have that many working hours for the bees. So it will take them a long time to go up, to get the food, to bring it back down, to dry it down if they need to store it. So it is something that you do want to start pretty early so that by the time the bees are consistently in a cluster that they have everything stored. So start early, feed often and early. So, and I, I mentioned that it is going to be um, a lot. So you can see this is at Auburn, how they mix it up um, with a canoe paddle, which I thought was clever. At this time of year, the recommendation is to do two to one. So that's sugar to water. And the sugar and the water is close enough um, mass wise that you can use volume. So you don't have to try to weigh it out. Um, when you do two to one sugar, you do generally have to heat it on a stove or something like that, unless you have a really, really hot water tank. It's with one to one, you can get away with it out of hot water out of the tap, but with two to one, you do want it to go into a solution. Um, so you generally want to heat it on the stove. I always get the question about what type of sugar. So as long as it is pure refined sucrose, that is ideal, which that means the white sugar. Um, when you have pure white sugar, it's so refined that there aren't other products in it, which we kind of think of as negative because that's empty calories, but that's what the bees need. They absolutely need empty calories because unlike us, they're going to have to go all winter without pooping. And they basically can't have a lot of extra ash content in there. So they have to be able to digest food really, really cleanly. So they absolutely need to have 
empty calories in there. When you start getting into things like brown sugar or sugar in the raw, it's going to be calories plus things that bees can't digest. So that's not going to be positive for them. In terms of whether or not you use beet sugar or cane sugar, by the time it goes through the refining process, the bees cannot tell a difference. It'll be effectively pure sucrose. Um, so from a bee's perspective, if it's organic, that won't matter because chemically it will look exactly the same. So whether or not you choose beet or cane really depends on, you know, do you want to support Michigan beet growers or do you want to have the organic label or something personal for yourself? But from a bee perspective, they don't care. Um, as long as it's sucrose, glucose, or fructose, but mostly we just have access to um, sucrose. Thanks, Megan. Dan's going to talk about different feeders for feeding syrup. Yeah, so Megan kind of covered covered the why, and I'll just just kind of touch on uh, the how, um, which is kind of the the devices that you can use. So if you make the decision that you you know your bees need to get some weight on, you're going to feed them syrup. There's kind of three primary types of feeders. There's a few others that are less commonly used, but these these that I'll touch on are the, the, the three most common ones. Um, so the first is um, for to call it gravity feeders, bucket feeders, cans. Um, it's all kind of the same thing. It's basically a volume, you know, it's a canister of syrup um, inverted on top of the hive. And either that can be if you have like a migratory type cover, a lot of times beekeepers have a hole drilled through that with like an inch and a half or two inch. You can put a plug in for when you don't have the feeder jug or feeder bucket on. Um, so you can feed through the lid like this metal can. You can see that's a through the lid feeder. Um, but if you have like a telescoping lid, then typically you put like that feed bucket uh, on top of the inner cover. And then a lot of times you put like an empty box, like an empty shell, um, just a, you know, a, a deep with no frames in it. Um, and then you can put the lid on it. So it kind of gives it that weather protection and, and um, keeps it from getting knocked off, probably deters the raccoons and things a little bit that sometimes like to come along and do those things. But the basic principle, again, gravity feeder, um, it's it works on a similar principle to like, you know, I remember growing up, had a hamster and it had the little thing, jug of water with the, the little nipple on the bottom. And if it's if it's working well, it's not just all going to pour out. What you do as a beekeeper, when you have this full, you invert it um, kind of, you know, you get a few drips out, but once it, then a vacuum should form. And so it won't drip out under its own pressure but it'll like Megan was saying, the bees kind of take this like one little sip at a time. So they'll be able to drink from it without it pouring down on top of them. So just a couple things to pay attention to. They either, the plastic buckets either typically come with like the bottom left here, like kind of some pinholes in the lid, or some of them um, have like a fine mesh screen like that. So it, again, that's the surface that the bees from up underneath are going to be sipping uh, that that syrup through and you do want to just pay attention a little bit these can get clogged either if when you're making your syrup you don't get a hundred percent dissolved in the syrup um so you'll have some grain sugar grains that that essentially just kind of fall to the bottom as you invert it and plug that or sometimes bees being bees they decide they want to propolize things so like with this mesh screen they've, they've started to propolize that um so one, one other thing to um consider with these feeders because they're kind of especially if you're feeding through the lid they're kind of outside the hive um if you don't have a real good seal on that bucket and it leaks you certainly can start robbing um if there's syrup kind of seeping or weeping out of that it's you know that's something you definitely want to avoid um but one really nice thing about the bucket feeders is like you saw a few slides back megan had a picture of a bee truck all filled with dozens and dozens of syrup buckets and a nice thing is you can do all that at home you could do that in your garage or your barn or wherever you do your bee stuff um and so you can kind of go out and basically all you have to do is you know if you know which hives you want to feed or you know you can kind of heft them you can invert a syrup bucket on that hive without opening it and disturbing it um so that's really nice and you're not you know you're not pouring syrup your, your chances to spill syrup in the yard and things like that are kind of minimized so that's a really nice aspect of the gravity feeders they do come in a variety of sizes if you want you can use a you know i've seen as small as like a 20 ounce soda bottle or a, a quart mason jar but typically when we're thinking about fall feeding we we really want to put on weight so kind of for fall generally the minimum size is like a gallon 
Um, and I've seen um, feeding with like these plastic buckets up to like a three gallon size used. Um, and that's kind of a function of efficiency of, you know, how far away are your bees if they're in your backyard and you can refill it every day or two, no problem. A gallon's fine. If they're a long drive away and you can get a couple gallons in, you know, a, a feeder bucket at a time, um, that's going to probably save you some travel time. So these are gravity feeders. Um, the next type of feeder that's pretty common is I call them frame feeders. I've heard them called division board feeders. Um, but they sit in your hive just parallel to the frames, actually they replace depending on the, the thickness of them, one or two frames. Um, they come in a variety of volumes. Um, the deeps, I think deep uh, for deep box frames, I think they come in one, one and a half and maybe a two gallon. That's, you know, a big wide might replace three frames. Um, and I, they do also um, make them for medium boxes as well. So the volume is going to be a little smaller there. But, um, you know, as a beekeeper, if you want to use this, I use these in, we use these in our colonies and they just live in the colony year round. So I fill them, you know, if I need to feed in the spring or feed in the fall, I, I know I've got that receptacle um, and it just becomes part of the hive. And, and so, you know, that's easy. It's not carting stuff back and forth to the bee yard. You do lose a little bit of um, comb area. So if you're running like a single or something like that, that, you know, that would be a consideration that you might not want to give up that, that comb space. Um, but basically this is just an open trough that you can pour syrup into um on the left there that's a nuke box and you see um the the feeder on the right side of that leftmost photo um that's just an open receptacle it is bowed in a little bit that's kind of one of the downsides of these these uh frame feeders is they they can tend to warp and twist like that with that one being kind of pinched in it's losing some of its volume another thing is be strong colonies will go in there and build comb and fill it with drone comb and, and honeycomb and all sorts of stuff, which depending on how tidy you like to keep your hives and whether or not you're trying to find a queen and don't want her to have hiding places like that. Um, it's one of those, it doesn't really matter. It can be kind of a nuisance sometimes, but um, one thing that in recent years has come along that's kind of improved on that is this this middle photo you see the the frame feeders on the left side there and you just see the two holes in it and what that is is it's called a um, cap and ladder system and so on the the photo on the right there kind of shows what's what's actually underneath that cap and so you've got you, your feeders got a wooden top across that it's still your same you know plastic frame shaped receptacle that holds a gallon or a gallon and a half it's got wood across the top so that keeps it from pinching in or twisting or bowing, cupping. Um, and then it's got these sleeves down inside of it that are these kind of plastic mesh tubes. And what that does is if the it gives you that, you know, that opening is probably an inch and a half or something at the top. So it's a pretty good, um, you know, you can feed, feed into that with a funnel or, a, you know, whatever your feeding system is. You can get your syrup in there. But it gives the bees access to all that syrup, but really minimizes the, the potential for drowning. If they fall in, they get stuck in the syrup. They actually have something with those plastic. That's what you're going to call the ladder. They can they can climb onto that plastic mesh and crawl out versus the, the frame feeder on that left photo where it's just an open receptacle. Um, one of the issues you can have is bees falling in and drowning. Um, one thing you can do with those open frame feeders like that to mitigate that is throw some handful of straw or, you know, sticks. Bracket fern is really good because it doesn't break down and get slimy. Um, but th throw something in there um, that, that gives the bees something to stand on. It's kind of the same idea as like if you put out a bee watering station, throw some corks in it or whatever it is, but give them some surface area. So if they do fall in, they can kind of drag themselves out and dry off. So those are frame feeders. Um, say they, they, you know, pretty good. Bees take it pretty fast. We like using them. The, the third kind of primary type of feeder um, is a top feeder. And what that what those are is actually um, so it's the same dimensions as hive bodies and they come in, you know, if you're in eight frame equipment or 10 frame equipment, you can buy these in in either size. Um, and so it's an actually um, not the exact depth. I think it's about a shallow, probably a shallow. It's about five inches or something like that, five and a half. Um, and they have these plastic tubs on either side some some are front and back some are side by side like this one you see here and it's just these big plastic receptacles that you can pour a bunch of syrup into another recent improvement that i've seen in these originally the first ones of these i see, saw just had like the two receptacles the bees could come up through the middle um 
they one a recent improvement is down the the photo on the right where we're pouring syrup and you can see this that this gray stripe down the middle that's this hardware cloth that the bees can come up from inside the hive and get at that syrup but they don't have open access to the point where they can fall in and drown so that's a that's a really nice feature that i i like i know these are things that they don't live on the hive year round um you know if i'm gonna go feed a yard and i think I, I like to use these a lot either if I've got singles where I don't want to give up a uh, a frame of drawn comb to like a frame feeder or in yards that are a long ways away because a, a nice part of these feeders, are the ones we have and they're pretty standard to hold, a, it's probably four, four and a half gallons. Um, so you can give, you know, you can give a lot of syrup to a colony um, quickly if you have something you really need to get a lot of weight on and don't have the time to make repeated trips. That's a really nice feature. One thing I will say, um, just from using these, it's your hives need to be fairly level. Um, if they're sitting at an angle, they're going to drain one side of it and the other side you're going to end up with syrup down at the end because they can only access it in the middle. So having it level on a left to right, um, that's that helps them get all of that syrup out. Um, and then whatever, you know, when you put your inner cover or whatever you've got for a cover on this, you want to make sure that that's bee tight. So you're not getting robbers coming in over the top. You want, you know, this, this kind of, it becomes, even though the bees have limited access through that middle, um, it is part of the hive. And if you, you know, put your lid back on as, as you would normally closing up a hive and make sure that there's no access through the top. Um, so I guess if you had a notched inner cover, you would want to flip that notch up. So it's so you've got a, a tight seal across the top, so bees can't get in through the top of that top feeder in a robbing scenario. So those are the three main types, kind of pros and cons of each. Um, but you can, you know, say it's they're all kind of situational, what works for you. Um, but those are some of the options. Again, if you need to feed, um, this is kind of some of the how you can do it. Thanks, Dan. All right, and next up we have Zach. So. Zach has a resource, resource on feeding honeybees and he'll um, mention what's in that document and anything else that we missed here. Hi. Uh, yeah, so a couple of years ago, I uh, wrote uh, as an extension pamphlet how uh, to feed bees. So it's pretty much uh, what Megan and Dan has covered different types of feeders, what concentrations of sugar to feed bees uh, depending on the seasons. The reason you want to do 50-50 in the spring is to simulate the honey flow and, uh, the, and to get the queens laying eggs quickly. And in the fall, you want to do two to one. It's because you want to minimize the effort of bees trying to make that into honey within a short period of time as uh, winter is closing in. But if you're feeding them right now, they probably stay as a month. So most people probably don't feed them now. They probably check their hives and realizing they're short of food around, I would say around October, mid-October. So then they only have like two or three weeks left, right? So if you feed them now, I feel you probably could get away with 50-50, which is much easier to make. Um, so and the bees can drink it much easier uh, if it's a frame feeder. With a gravity feeder, probably they don't, doesn't make a big difference. But a top feeder or a frame feeder, if it's too thick, Bees usually, uh, because of viscosity, it's much harder to suck a 66% sugar syrup compared to a 50% sugar syrup. Like just watch bees of sucking honey. They really have trouble to do that. It's uh, whiskers. So, and also mentions feeding the water. That's during the summer, of course, and whether to put some salt into the water to keep your bees. Uh, so they don't move away to, uh, to a swimming pool next door because they have more, they have some crow in it and uh, these taste a little bit different. These don't like just clean water. The, if, if you use bottled water, that's you know, too, too clean for them because they want to have some minerals and some sodium 
in them. That's why they want to go to that uh, stale uh, pool somewhere or the creek that's further than your artificial feeder. So adding some sort of prayer would help you keeping the bees uh, loyal to that same feeder. Another, another point is you have to start early so otherwise, bees will, bees will form in a habit by going two miles away to forage on a creek for water, and you're giving them water next door right in front of the hive, but it's never a bit too late. So you have to start early, probably sometime in May, uh, and uh, not in July, because they already have the site to go already. So. Properly, so you cannot really feed them, but some people brush. There was studies in my last lab showing if you paint the inside hives with uh, propolis, that would help your bees of fighting disease better, or creating artificially uneven surfaces inside the hive so the bees will forage for propolis, trying to make it smooth. And that has been shown in. In the studies, I'm not sure actually any beekeepers are practicing that or not because it's uh, quite involved. And you you have usually will have a lot of properties anyway. I as the stuff I really hate when I work with bees, <laughs> sticky on my hands on my fingers. I try to use my cell phone to take a photo. The cell phone becomes sticky and it's very hard to wash them off. Of course, half of my pants have probably stains and we can't really wash them off. So. Thanks, Zach. Great. So that um, so Megan just put the link to that document, that resource that Zach wrote in the chat. And then I, then I also saw that she added the links for Dan's blog post. So Dan wrote blog posts on the different types of feeders. So if you have questions about feeding honeybees, there's a lot of resources for you there. All right, we're going to move on to Varroa mites. And this is really a group conversation. Um, but, you know, we've been talking about Varroa every month so far on our webinars. Hopefully there's already things that you've been doing to monitor and manage Varroa mites in your colonies. Um, but this is another time of year where we're really thinking a lot about Varroa mites in terms of uh, management and what management options are available to us. So, um, Again, we have resources online on managing Varroa. Megan has a document on making a plan for the Varroa mite that has different treatment options kind of explained and listed there. Another really helpful guide is the Tools for Varroa Management Guide from the Honeybee Health Coalition that goes through your different treatment options. But I would say some things to consider this time of year. Uh, one is whether or not you have honey supers on or not. And so if you've already pulled your honey supers off and you've extracted all the honey that you plan to, for human consumption, you'll have more treatment options available to you. Um, so those include some of the time oil-based treatments like Apigard or Apolifar. Uh, you can use those when you don't have honey supers on. Uh, you're still want, going to want to pay attention to the temperatures and the forecast. Um, and if they're the colony size and strength, and if there's any limitations around that as well. Um, so I'll just kind of let people kind of chime in here in terms of what are you seeing in terms of mites or what kind of management are you considering this time based on your situations? Start with Megan. It's like, oh, that's us. Um, well, so one of the things that I've been doing all summer is doing a miticide research trial. And we don't have the data yet to share, but it's I've learned a ton even just carrying out the trial. So what we do is we um, do sticky boards. So we look at mite fall and we collect that every single week. And this is on about 40 hives. And we look at how many mites fall off of the bees every week with different treatments on the colonies. And then we're also doing the alcohol washes at the same time. And one of the things that have been the most eye-opening for me is even when we're seeing fairly low or medium levels in the alcohol washes, we're literally counting thousands of mites and sometimes over a thousand mites per week. 
that are falling off of individual hives. Um, so I think that was something that was really interesting for me to see with my own eyes. And these are also, these are colonies that look perfectly healthy. So no signs of parasitic mite syndrome or, you know, we're not seeing mites crawling. We're not seeing deformed wings. These are in colonies that functionally look healthy, but because we're doing all of this trapping. So even when you see like 2% or 3% mites, you have to think about how big the colony is at this time of year. And if you've got like 50,000 bees, that 2% can still represent, you know, thousands of parasites crawling all over your precious bees. So we've been um, going out and doing formic acid at this time of year, just because we are half on with honey supers and, and half off. And that's, that's considered like our cleanup method at the end of this trial. Great. Thanks. Anyone else have anything to talk about in terms of Broa? I mentioned um, some monitoring options for people are still, you know, the alcohol wash or the powdered sugar roll test. Um, it is kind of helpful to know where your mite levels are, especially if you've um, been managing all season to kind of know post-treatment where your levels are, or if you're about to do a treatment to make a plan to do a Varroa mite test afterwards. Um, and we have some videos on how to do that on the key, Be Is Alive part of the website. All right, well, we can answer more questions about mites as you put them into the Q&A box. Uh, there is a program evaluation survey that should open up what, once we close the webinar, and it'll also go out in the follow-up email that'll go out tomorrow. Uh, we're thankful that we have some funding that supports our projects and work. And next, we're going to turn it over to you all. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. And I see that lots of people have already been doing that. So we have lots of questions to uh, start with. All right. Yeah. And we'll try to just get to them as they come in. So the very first one, Jason asks, um, with the change in the weather, is it a good time to prepare my bees for winter or should I give them more time? And I'm very excited to speak about this one first and then other people can chip in. Um, so in my opinion, what we have just talked about with the two bit things being controlling Varroa and feeding, that is winter preparation. So all I do with my colonies is I make sure they are very well fed and I make sure they are very healthy, which in this context really is, translates into not being overrun with parasites. So if I'm managing Varroa and I'm feeding them, that is winter prep. Um, everything else like wrapping, closing the entrance, putting a spacer, giving, you know, dancing around it and praying to the winter gods, like those are things you can do, but none of those things will have a direct relationship to like high numbers of winter survival. So in my mind, this is what we do for winterizing. Um, I know people do additional things, but those are not really the things that lead to big differences in survival. So if, on our data, if you want to add to that. Oh, sorry, I do add mouse guards. So that's the that's the only thing and I wait till the drones get kicked out, but that is the other thing that I do. Yeah, we're a same mindset here. We're, you know, we've been, I, I kind of think the, you know, thinking about wintering starts in like the end of spring. Um, but, and, and that's, that's because my control is not just the tick that box once or twice a year. It's a, it's a whole comprehensive what's going on. What am I, what are we doing? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it really, it's, if you're keeping your parasite load down and then the real over the next, you know, month ish is kind of the window for, for fall feeding, getting things up to weight. Um, but yeah, we, we don't do a ton as far as the, the wrapping or things like that. We have some wraps, some of, some of the be cozy, some cardboard sleeves. We use them cause we have them, but we've got more hives than we have, uh, wraps. And I can't say I've noticed the difference in those that have gone wrapped versus unwrapped the last handful of years. Um, we do put, uh, a reducer in and a mouse guard on, but that's, probably at some point mid late October, something like that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at with things. 
All right. There's a couple on Robin and Anna very smartly already <clears throat> gave me a Robin resource to post. Um, so Dan, if you want to keep this going, um, do you have to feed all hives at one time to prevent Robin? Um, in, in my experience, no. If you're, you know, if you're feeding, um, you know, the main things to prevent robbing when you, when you are feeding is like avoiding spills. Um, and whether you're, you know, syrup from a bucket into a frame feeder or you're using your, your gravity feeder or something like that, not slopping it around. Um, but yeah, no, I, you know, I, I do, we do a lot of spot feeding, like some yards we have have really good fall flows or just because of how they've been managed through the year we get out there when we start feeding and it's like, Oh, this one is like, all right, this one's got plenty. It doesn't need anything. Um, and others might get fed maybe three, four times over a course of a couple of weeks. So very much case by case, hive by hive basis for that. Um, I will say if you, yeah, the, you doesn't as much apply to feeding one versus feed them all. But if you're concerned about something and robbing, it, it can be feeding and, you know, using an entrance reducer, these other things we talked about, I think sounds like maybe a resource in the chat about robbing and mitigating robbing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, you know, you can spot feed the ones that need it and the ones that don't, you know, they don't, that's fine. I must you use the uh, front entrance feeder. Some people, some hobbyists, have a contraption sitting on the entrance with a, a glass jar, and that's very inviting for Robin. Yeah, you always find Robin. If you use that kind of feeder, so I would not recommend that type. That uses a mason jar, so people think it's cheaper to do, but it's a pain because you have to refill it every two or three days. And uh, if there's a sun hitting it, it's going to come up faster because it, it expands the sugar syrup, so it drains too fast. Or sometimes the thing, I'm not sure if the came was the lids was horse. Sometimes beekeeper have to nail the nails themselves, nail too many and too large holes. It's just the sugar just come out in two hours <laughs> and big mass. And all the yellow jackets would come, not only the rubber bees, but wasps also, because it's a thing. They get attracted to sugar at this time of year. Both yeah, that's a good point. It's definitely not just the honeybees that are are robbing. Um, Anna, can you freeze frames of your partially capped and partially uncapped honey for next year? This is a good question because I feel like everybody will be either has been in this situation or will be in this situation where you have partially capped and partially uncapped frames. I don't see a problem with that if you have the freezer space to do it. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I've done sometimes if I don't have the freezer space and especially early on is if I have an inner cover, I'll put the partly um, filled supers above the inner cover. And then sometimes the bees kind of move the uncapped nectar down as it's kind of like they would it from a feeder. So that's one way of dealing with some of the uncapped stuff. They don't always move it down. It works some of the time. Um, but I'd say especially now when it's earlier on in the season and we're still getting warm weather, if you put uncapped honey up there that, you know, is maybe pretty wet and not ready to extract, they might move some of it down. And then Dan, do you want to talk about what we did today or what you did? with? Uncapped? Um, yeah, so we so we pulled honey off campus bees today. Um, and it is, you know, on one hand, it's it's great to have late summer nectar. On the other, it puts you in this position of like, there's never really a period where there has been a long enough dearth at the end of the season where everything you pull is going to be, you know, capped and dried and, and ready to go. So um, we put, we took it all off because we're, you know, getting into fall management in the bees in the field and it's, it's in the hot room, um, you know, so basically heat and a dehumidifier and airflow is your friend if you've got frames of uncapped honey we have some that we know are too wet um and we're gonna we're gonna try to dry that down and we will certainly pull a couple percent of moisture out of that um just by essentially moving warm air across that honey honey in a humid environment or uncapped honey will suck in moisture and in a dry arid environment it will 
give off moisture and dry out. So we're going to, we're creating that warm, dry environment to, to bring that moisture down. Excellent. And then there's a couple questions about moving frames around. So um, there's a general one and a specific one. So I'll do the specific one first. Anna, if you maybe want to address this. So it's a colony that's in three deeps and the top box is only partially drawn. So I was going to consolidate it into two deeps for winter, but I found one frame of brood in the top box and was uncertain about moving it. Is it okay to move it down to consolidate or should I wait until those bees hatch before I move it? Sure, so I'd say the main principle that you should be following right now is to keep the brood nest together. So if you just have one frame in that top box and you wanna put it down below, keeping it in that brood nest, that should be fine. And then there's kind of the opposite question is, can you put, or should you put any honey frames into the brood box? Do you want to address that one too? Sure. So again, we're really trying to kind of think about how our bees naturally organize their resources and their hives. So we want to keep the brood nest together and those frames of brood um, kind of touching each other. But if you have extra honey frames and maybe, for example, if you have foundations still, you can remove those foundations, put honey in there. We're trying to keep honey along the sides of the brood nest and then above the brood nest as well. And we at MSU and in my own hives, we try pretty hard to keep like honey frames for humans separate from bee frames. So you can take, you know, if they're the same size, you could take a honey frame out of a super and move it down below if you're using like all mediums. But you would want to be careful not to move stuff around in the spring. Um, there's three really fast questions about feeding that I'm going to do um, high speed that are just confirmation. So one was just confirming that it is two sugar to one water. So when Zachary and I were talking about fall feeding, it is the higher concentration of sugar. So it's correct. It's two sugars to one water um, compared to one to one that you would do in the spring. The second question is, is it granulated sugar or powdered sugar or confectioner sugar? It's just straight granulated sugar. So just like white sugar that you use for baking. And then someone asked about if you should add salt and usually in this context we're just it's just sugar and water again you want like a very very um clean feed for them and i i wondered if the salt question was in response to what zach was talking about earlier about adding salt to a water source oh yeah that makes way more sense so they can yeah. taste it yeah yeah that's in my pamphlet uh but to Repeated here, a recent study has shown that bees prefer, so given bees all kinds of different salt concentrations, the bees prefer 0.2 to 0.3% sugar, sodium chloride. So you, so one teaspoon per gallon is about 0.11%. So you need to put about tea, two teaspoons in uh, one in one gallon of water. If you use one gallon, yeah. so that same ratio. Or you can weigh them if you're a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, that makes much more sense. I was on the, the sugar roll. Um, so Dan, going back to the drying off of the honey, um, our dear friend Lori asks, what temperature and what humidity are you using to dry the uncapped honey? Um, so we, the uh, about 95-ish, um, and that's, again, that's more or less hive temperature. We don't really want to go beyond what the bees take it to themselves. And then, um, the drier, the better. We just have a, you know, a closed, a space that we can close off. That's relatively airtight and set a dehumidifier to run continuously. Um, so I don't know. It probably gets down in the, I, I actually, I don't know. I shouldn't even guess at what the percentage. We just let a dehumidifier run constantly and empty it out when it gets full. And it's, it's surprising how, um, the volume of water that it will pull out um, for even after we've dried the ambient air in that room. Um, so then you kind of know it's it's just coming from um, the, the nectar that is drying off. So the drier, the better. And I'd say somewhere in the low mid nineties, if you can do it. I thought you had a tube that uh, drains out so you don't have to dump the water every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can have it continually draining yeah. to a, yeah. 
Yep, somewhere away we have it draining to a floor drain. So and perhaps if you have a building with beautiful floor drains. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and there is a question too about the relative humidity, but I think um, it is, you know, we have a, a box fan and a dehumidifier that you get at whatever store. Yeah, it's a, that's not anything specialized. It's just I've got them running the same as I've got running in the basement. Just the, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Going back to the early questions. So there's some questions about queens um is it common for hives to be going through supersedure at this time of year i have a couple hives with cat brood and no fresh eggs and two to three hatched queen cells um if someone else wants this one i would say that it's not as common as it is right after swarming that's when you see kind of the most of them but it's you know bees can supersede all of the time especially if you are not careful about replacing your queens and putting in young queens. Um, and so Mike follows up with, how do you know if you have a weak queen this time of year? And I don't really like the term weak queen because, you know, basically she's either laying and she has the sperm to do so, or she's not. Um, usually when people are evaluating queens and saying that she's strong or weak, it's usually a colony issue, you know, where they have poor nutrition or a disease. What you can see in the colony, though, and what can happen at this time of year is that she runs out of sperm. And that one, I was looking for a picture really quickly, and I don't know if one of you have it um, accessible, but what it looks like is on a frame where you should see workers and it should be like nice flat capped worker cells you'll see flat capped worker cells and then boom, a drone and then boom, another drone and boom, another drone. So it's almost like little like pop-ups throughout the thing. And basically she's, you know, holding that egg back in her vel fold intending to um, fertilize it. And there's just no sperm that comes out. And so she, you know, is laying in a worker size cell and you'll see a drone. So you can, you can absolutely have queens run out of sperm at this time of year, especially if they're older queens um, and went through a big um, spring buildup as well. And that's how you'd see it. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Um, all right, so there's a couple questions about feeding winter patties, which we are gonna talk about next month. But I don't know, Zachary, if you wanna talk about using like um, so there's, when do you recommend feeding winter patties, fondant, sugar cakes, candy boards, or if you want to touch on that briefly? Winter patties? I'm not sure what that means. That they, they actually, like, did not now sell, or some of the other companies okay. sell, like, they look like pot, but I think just, it's like basically a fondant that has a much smaller amount of um, pollen, but it looks kind of like a pollen patty. But it's, so it's more sugar? It's, yeah, it's more sugar, exactly. Yeah, that uh, makes the message. I think uh, God only is my PhD, otherwise I'm from Canada. I did a study trying to feed pollen in the fall to see if that makes them longer-lived beans uh, and, and maybe help through the winter process. But it, it doesn't seem to help, strangely. I think because... Because this relates to another question, how when do winter bees or uh, the immunized bees start? Did, mm -hmm. did bees start? So that's most studies actually now point that it's a uh, lack of brood pheromone. So it's basically the last batch of brood uh, that emerges, and when they emerge out, there's no no larva to raise. So those bees will survive through the winter. So if you feed too much pollen, then you can prolong the brooding period in the fall. And that actually contradicts your purpose because no longer the brood ruin and they later the winter bee will become unstuck. So then, so if I give them a lot of pollen right now, they, so normally I think Michigan bees stop brooding around December, mid-December. So that's that last, I'm talking about queen, stops totally. But even the months before that, that's probably just enough brood, not enough brood to cause those bees to not become winter bees. 
So I would say bees even emerge in November, mid of November would be, would be long lived bees. Even the queens are not stopping until mid December. And then they start again in the middle of February ish, a two months break period. But if you, if you feed them too late, then you're going to prolong that egg laying by the queen instead of this small bird, uh, in, inside the cluster, you get this big one that's going to make the bees, you know, summer bees, because too much brood family. So, so that's why they study give a mixed message that feeding bees late in the, in the fall doesn't really help your bees live longer. But it's it's a, it's a lab study because it's counting how long the bees are living. So it's not really directly linked to winter survival per se. But of course, you can postulate that the bees are not long living, and of course, the colony might not be long living either. So that's a, that's a missing link. Uh, it's a lab, it's sort of a lab study in observation hive. So I would say a, a good fall feeding probably should be actually earlier, sometime during that dearth period, sometime in August or September, I guess, on pollen, because there's a lack of flowers that give you a boost of brood ruin. And, um, and those bees, hopefully, will raise the next batch of winter bees. So it's sort of convoluted, it's not direct. The pollen is not going to make the winter bees, but you you use pollen to raise the nurse bees, which then raise the winter bees. So you have to be doing the two month ahead, two or three months ahead. I had one beekeeper saying, yeah, that's how he does it. He says, he read my theoretical papers, the regulation of division of labor in the colonies. And he says, oh, that's great. That's why I feed the bees very early in August and, uh, when there's a dearth in Michigan and um, have the colonies build up during that dearth period. So. Uh, I'll just add too, so because you were talking a lot about pollen, but one thing that we're thinking about in terms of just getting, you know, sugar and weight into mm -hmm. the hive, yeah. Yeah. ideally we really want to get, do as much feeding of, so A, hopefully your bees have lots of nectar from the environment. B, if they don't, or if you're not sure, we want to do a lot of feeding with syrup in the fall because the bees are able to move that syrup, store it in the combs, and then access it through the winter. Things like fonda and uh, winter patties and mountain camp with the dry sugar are kind of like emergency feeding. So um, it can be harder for bees to access winter feed when they're clustered in the hives and the temperatures are really cold. So ideally we want to do feeding now so that we're not having to do emergency winter feeding, or if we are doing it, we're doing it just as a backup. Yeah, the sugar balls are usually emergency feedings that mm -hmm. you do in, most people do it in February. When you see the cluster, it's near the top. And really, I uh, experienced people can tell uh, how high the cluster is inside that two or three sugar stack. So the closer they are near the top, then the less food they have. So if it's in February, then you can see them under the inner cover, that's, that's bad news. So then that's when you give them abundant or the uh, sugar boards and uh, the other one. The more popular method uh, is having a box with a newspaper and this and have dry sugar that are on top. Uh, what is a yeah. camp? And but just to, to reiterate what, what Anna said is like those dry ones are the ones that you if that's what you do if you can't get the liquid feed in right now. So um we'll cover it a lot more next month, but hopefully every you know, and, and life does happen and sometimes you can't get them fed up or you know, something happens. But at this time of year, I would focus on the liquid feed. And then if that doesn't happen well. Then we go on to the other ones. Um, so I'm going to switch gears back to Varroa stuff. Um, Anna, someone just asked if you could please explain the alcohol wash. Sure. So there's lots of different ways to do it and um, different videos and resources of people showing you how to do it. One way that we've been doing at MSU, and um, if you come to the fall conference, we'll give you a jar that has a screen on it. So it's just like a mason jar or a regular jar. 
Um, but what we do is we collect a sample of about 300 bees. So that's about a half cup or 100 milliliters of bees into a scoop. We put them into a jar with isopropyl alcohol. We shake that jar with a closed lid for a minute. And then we pour the alcohol and the mites uh, through the screen into a bucket. So the bees can't pass through the screen and they stay in the jar. The alcohol and the mites go into the bucket. We sometimes do another rinse or two with isopropyl alcohol, but really it's just a way to dislodge the mites and count how many mites we have from a sample. But really the probably the, the best way is to see this or to watch some videos and we can put the link in our chat about how to find our Borrower resources. And then there's, on that same note, there's questions about um, using the CO2 method or powdered sugar or alcohol or Dawn dish detergent. Do you wanna speak to your experience with any of the other methods and Dan too? Sure, we've done the powdered sugar real test and normally we say, you know, that's pretty good for getting a good estimate of the number of mites in your sample. If we're doing something that's we want to be pretty precise, we use isopropyl alcohol, and we also count the number of bees in our sample. Um, Megan should talk about dish soap because that's been pretty cool to see. If you want to talk about your method that we just learned? Yeah, so, um, and I, this is dish soap. I feel strongly about dish soap after the bees are dead is what I like. I don't like using dish soap as a way to kill the bees. Um, so Dan and I are actually on a committee for the AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, that looks into animal welfare. Um, and this is the first time that honeybees are brought in. And one of the things we talk about is ways that, you know, the bees do die in this process and you want them to die very quickly. Um, in my experience, when we've tried things like lower percentage of alcohol, like the um, windshield wiper cleaner or um, with the dish detergent, it doesn't kill them as quickly. But the, the method that I like is we get the bees, we actually freeze them on dry ice in the field, or you can take them and put them in your freezer at home. And then they die very quickly. And then what I do is use a kitchen stand mixer. And I just put dish soap and water in, turn on the mixer, like the kind that you're going to use to make cookies. And then you just run it while you go do other things. And then that knocks all of the mites off. It does not grind up the bees. Um, I'll post a video at some point. We've taken videos of it. But that's nice for us because, you know, we go out in the field, we collect from 40 different hives, we put them in the freezer. And then on a nice day, we just sit and go through um, with, with the dish soap. There are, Randy Oliver's been doing some things looking at, um, Dawn Professional versus Dawn Ultra, and that, that seems to work a little better, but I don't feel very strongly about that in my experience. Um, I have not used this CO, I've used CO2 to knock out bees. I haven't used it to kill them just because it's physically so difficult in the field, if unless you have like the setup for it. And then um, for the powdered sugar, I do still teach that to the veterinarians. We did, someone mentioned the comparison that Randy and I did showing them to be equivalent. And that's true. We've definitely done hives where you do the, both the powdered sugar and an alcohol wash in the same hive and gotten basically the same results um, many, many times. The reason that I teach the alcohol wash is that it's much faster and less, it's easier. You're going to screw up less. It's harder and you can have better more options to screw up with the powdered sugar roll. So there's more ways to do it wrong with that, but they're, they're both fine if you do them right. I don't, Dan, have you have any experience with the CO2 method? Um, I tried it once with the little, um, the little, like the bike in it. Yeah. Uh, it didn't, it was like, you got like two samples out of one canister. So it was pretty expensive. And then, um, ended up getting, I think, cause it was like chilled, ended up getting a lot of condensation on like the, the jar. So like the mic stuck to the wall instead of falling down. So it wasn't my favorite, but I don't have extensive experience with it. Um, there is, so the honeybee, Nancy asks, is the honeybee health coalition recommends limiting to only one oxalic acid treatment for winter bees. What are the research findings behind this limitation? Honor, Dan, do you have any insight into this? 
I'll let you take it, Megan. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so honestly, I don't know about the research where I think I'm, I'm going to give you my best um, guess, though, is that if you look at the EPA label, they recommend just one treatment and then they say it should not be used. And I could put that in the chat, too, that it should not be used when there's brood on because that would require many, many treatments. So my thought is that not so much that it is a um, research based thing, but kind of coming out of the spirit of not treating more than you need to. And per what they think that um, you, as long as there's no brood, you don't necessarily need to treat multiple times in succession because in theory, all of the mites are available. Um, that's my thought. That's based on just my thoughts, just for clarification. I do have to say that there isn't a boatload of research behind the oxalic acid label. And I am on a committee that is looking at um, redoing some of the label language. And that's one of the things that we're discussing. And there is going to be a big review coming out of that as well. Um, but there's definitely a lot more research that needs to be done. Um, I think on OA related to brood in particular, there's also people looking into different dosages and things like that. But that's a good question. Um, one possibility is maybe there, even though some people say you can't have resistance uh, using formic acid or oxalic acid, but one prudent way is to treat it only once to reduce the chance of resistance development. Even because we don't really know the mechanism how the mites are killed by either formic or oxalic, but what you don't know doesn't mean I mean it's safe. That's that there will never develop resistance. That's not true. You know, it could be multiple ways the mites are killed, but then that slows down the resistance. But anytime you're trying to kill something, unless it's extreme, like using fire, you know, maybe it's uh, less likely to have resistance. Uh, but if you're using the high temperature, for example, to kill the mites, eventually mites could become resistant, more tolerant of heat, for example, and that's using fire, you know, to kill them. So that's, that's a uh, traditional thought for a scientist, for, from a scientific point of view, is anytime you're trying to kill something, there will be ways that could develop mechanisms to reduce uh, the, the kill, in other words, become resistant. Um... All right, so there is, oh, this is a good question. Is it okay to feed sugar syrup when treating for varroa with formic acid? Um, Anna, are you comfortable with that one? Um, I'll double check, but I believe the label says no. Yes, so th this one though, I think, so the label officially says no, um, but this is another thing of like trying to understand why the labels say no. One of the nice thing about the company that produces formic acid is that they are very open to phone calls. They have a scientist on staff that answers research questions and you can ask them about the strength of the reasoning behind this being on the label. So a lot of things that go into labels are not necessarily like there's this fine balance between getting things to the market and making sure people are safe and also making sure there's enough information to be usable. Like I would never, ever, ever, ever question anything regarding human health. Like if it tells you to wear a respirator or put certain gloves on, make sure you do that. But there's other things that you can call them and, and ask them why in particular that's on the label. Um, and if this wasn't recorded and posted on the internet, I'd probably be more liberal with how I talk about that too. But yes, according to the formic acid label, you're not supposed to, but you can ask them um, about that. Um, I, so here's one, Dan, if you want to do, it says, I have junk honey, and junk is in quotes, from old combs that have been melted down. Can I feed this to colonies? Is there a way to sanitize this honey so viruses are not transmitted? Um, as far as sanitizing, maybe, I don't know. 
Um, I, I just get rid of it, to be honest. I mean, I don't know. It's sometimes junk is just junk. Um, the general best practice is, is recommendation is n- not to feed honey back to bees because of not just viruses, but other potential disease transmission, certainly from outside your operation, but I think that potential exists even inside your operation. So uh, my, my preference would be not to uh, feed that back to bees. Yeah. And I don't, I can't think of a way you could sanitize it without damaging it. Just because if you tried to use heat or something like that, you're probably going to create HM, hydroxymethyl fear for alls, which are going to be bad. Like you would, you wouldn't be able to kill a virus without changing the the composition of the sugars. Um, So I think if you see it as junk, call it as junk. Um, Does moving a colony in September present any specific risk to bees compared to moving them in the spring? Um, How about Anna? We're discussing moving hives right now. So if you guys want to talk about the decisions behind that. I mean, the nice thing about moving them in the spring is they're often lighter. And also, if you don't know what your colony survival is going to be, it's a lot easier to move boxes that don't have bees in them than boxes that do have bees in them. Um, other than yeah, other than that, I don't think it really matters that much. I wouldn't do. I wouldn't move bees if they're clustered and it's really really cold, and you're worried about jostling them and then them not being able to recluster. But if you have warm fall temperatures and you're doing it when temperatures are cool enough that they're not flying or at night, that would be fine. Um, all right. So there is a question on fall feeding and fumigillin. So in the old days, we used to do fall feeding and add fumigillin. Not so much anymore. What are your thoughts on it? Um, does anyone hear? I have thoughts, but if other people have thoughts too. So fumigillin is the antibiotic that's used to treat nosema disease. It is still effective against Nozema apis and Nozema serrani, which are, so it's a microsporidial disease that comes into colonies and especially is dangerous when they're clustered. The issue with Fumagillin and Fumadil B, which that's the name for it, is one is that there have been production issues, so it's not always available. Um, The other is that it is toxic to humans. So you're obviously doing this after you take honey off, but you want to make sure that you're the kind of person that's very careful about keeping their honey separate for humans um, as it is for from the stuff from bees. The other thing, though, that is kind of why it's fallen out of favor or isn't standard practice is even though it shows that it reduces an active infection, um, it's only effective while it's actually in the colony and the microsporidia are in this vegetative or reproduction phase. So if you don't have an active infection in the fall and, you know, they eat the fumigillin and then the dose of the fumigillin goes down, you, um, it's no longer protective. Like it doesn't kill the spores that are in the colony. So then if an infection comes back, it can actually be worse after the feeding. Um, and this is especially true for Nozema serrani. So in the old days, um, the old days, like before, 2006, um, we used to only have Nozema apis, or that's what we thought we had, which is one species of it that really was only a problem in the fall and the spring when the bees are clustered. And then in the now, we see Nozema serrani all summer long. Um, so that's when you can get that hyperproliferation, you know, where the bees leave cluster. The other hard thing about Nozema is that it's very, very hard to tell whether or not you have a problem. So you could sample your bees, you could go in there, you could find, you know, you sample 100 bees and you have 10 million spores, but you don't know if that's in one bee or if that's across 10 bees or 100 bees. And that you can have a colony that's going to have millions of spores that's totally fine without treatment. And you can have a colony with millions of spores that um, could have treatment. So it is pretty hard. Um, Zachary has studied a ton of Nozema. I don't know if you want to talk about Fumadil or Fumagillin at all. Yeah, it's, so, yeah what, what Megan said is correct. There's study by another Hua showing that the lower, the, 
lower concentration of fumagillin actually stimulates azimal spore production. So initially it suppresses it at the recommended dose, but then it's going to go, the drug is going to wear off and uh, degrade and then during that degradation at the just at the near the tail, there's a little bit of fumagillin, probably one tenth of the recommended dose that the Nazima actually bounce back worse than, than the control, then you don't have the drug. So that's a very bad thing to have. Uh, good. Uh, especially if you feed them now, then it wears off right in, uh, in the winter bee stage. That's probably bad. So, yeah, and another issue is whether Nazima will eventually become resistant if we treat with that. Same drug. It has so far we're lucky. Have has been used since sixties. Yeah. So. All right. So Dan, someone's calling you out on your past practices of using foam insulation boards under the top cover. Um, but if someone went that route, should they remove the inner cover and the gravity feeder? Yeah, and so I'm wondering, and I. I may have been speaking about foam insulation boards. I'm wondering maybe if I was speaking about moisture boards, which is also like a lightweight kind of foamy consistency that I, I have used. Um, but yes, if whatever you're doing in those, like, you know, adding things for the winter, the the wraps, the covers, the quilt boards, you know, insulation on top, um, those, those are after the feeding period is done. Like we're kind of in the feeding window now, if you want to feed these, um, but yeah, you're not going to leave. Basically, if you're using a gravity feeder on top, that's for like a, you know, fall and or spring feeding window. And then um, your all your configuration of your hive is for the winter or whatever you're going to add to it um, is not going to include like that gravity feeder on top. Um, and then... Okay, there's more Varroa questions. So for the first time in four years, my Varroa count is low for August. Woohoo! The sample, like took the three highs, the zero, zero, and one. But given that there is a lot of capped brood, should I treat with Formic Pro anyway? Honey supers are still on for expected fall flow. It sounds like Megan is encouraging this given the large mite drop that she had. Um it's, it, I think it does kind of depend on, uh, I'm, I'm just going to take this because it says Megan's encouraging this. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily bad to, you know, if you're seeing mites at this time of year, and I don't know if it's 0% or, or 1% or 1%, but um, just for me, everything changed in my survival rates when I took Varroa control as one of the most critical things. And for me, like coming from the side of a very strong animal welfare side, the parasite management for me is, is paramount. That being said, you know, you don't want to be on the side of just over treating and all of the treatments, including Formic, have, um, you know, negative effects. Plus, we are about to go into a week of really, really high temperatures that we have to work around, too, in some parts of the state. So I, I would say that it, it makes more sense depending on what your season long management strategy has been. Um, if you're fully brooded up and you've got three boxes of brood and I still had, I, I, I would still consider that, I, I wouldn't say that it's a job done. Like I would say that if you're at zero, zero, one, that's more of a sign that you've been um, doing a good job, but there is still kind of a lot of season left. The other thing is, um, Anna actually has really nice data for this from um, some colonies in Minnesota, where this is the time of year that you also get a lot of um, mi migration into your colonies from other colonies as they start to collapse. So you'll start to hear people collect collecting swarms again. And a lot of that is, and there's drifting and we've talked about robbing. And at this time of year, you can have a lot of mites come into the colonies. Um, and so, the um it is something that it's it, it's good to be where you're at now but there's still a lot of season left i don't know if, Anna, if you want to speak to that uh yeah i mean even here in michigan too we did some projects where we were just monitor monitoring the same colonies once per month and it is sometimes common that we'll see 
really low levels or zero mites in our samples in August and September, and then crazy high levels in October. So um, just because we're not finding them in our samples doesn't mean there's not a lot of mites still in those hives. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two questions on the, oh, and, and I'm gonna put the label in. There are two questions about the double-stranded RNA for Varroa control. Um, and I'll put a link, Zachary's worked on some, you were doing some RNA on Varroa control, right? With Alex. Yeah. Um, so I'll put the one published study that I know about in the chat, but I don't know if you want to speak to that or what you were getting. Yeah, sure. This uh, from reading the news, it seems maybe it's the same original technology by the Israeli scientist Biologics, which was then purchased by Monsanto. And Monsanto became purchased by Bayer. And now this green uh, green light or something is buying it from Bayer. <laughs> so it's convoluted. Uh, and I thought it was a dead. I thought it was dead somewhere because I have a Biologics. That was 15 years ago. And then um, and I never had any news about it. I talked to, uh, is it Jay? Jerry? Jerry, yeah. Jerry Harris. I talked to him about what happened. And it seems to say that it was, it was dead because government doesn't want to approve anything it's using transgenic stuff, using RNAi, which you may be afraid of escaping to other organisms. Stuff like that. So even though it's against the law, which is very unlikely, you know, it's it's possible that it could become could be migrated to honeybees, and then you know, a far stretched theory would be then honeybees, you know, the double strain eye goes into the honey, we we'll eat it, and then messes up our system. So that was one worry that. But the company is saying they're hoping the product will be there next year. So we'll see. I thought it's a lot of, lot of hoops to jump by EPA and, uh, and uh, FDA because of that. This could be considered as transgenic. Uh, that, and it could be mobile because uh, double strain on that could be transferred between different organisms. So that's my that's my concern. Even though I did a study in my lab trying to find genes I could lock down to kill the mites. And we found a few genes that make the mites uh, having less babies and a few genes that actually kill them. So this is after the Israeli study, which did a whole bunch of genes together and just looking at the mite drop, not, not an actual mechanism of if the mites are dead or something, but they just look at it, just count the mites. And the sample size is quite small. Like the control would have four mites per colony, you know, a drop, and the treated might have 0 0.1. So it's not a huge difference, but it's significant. So that's that's the data it was it was like that. Yeah, it's not a lab study. My study was a lab, we actually counted mite babies after injecting the mites was a different gene, different uh, double strain RNA, again, targeting different genes and kind of babies. So it's a little bit more uh, specific, more accurate. So yeah, I mean, it is, oh, sorry. It is really interesting route for people to be look at. And I'm personally happy that we're looking at all sorts of solutions, but it's a long ways from showing that something works in the lab to getting things approved and improved in a way that is making sure that we have stuff that's safe for bees and safe for humans. Right. Um, okay, so the reason it's a hot topic is because there was a talk last night by the Southwestern Ohio beekeepers. Um, that checks out. Um, all right, we're getting down. I'm happy that these are really good questions. Um, okay, so the other day we started Varroa treatment on 20 hives. The next day they had 10 of them robbing each other. It was terrible. Reduced entrances to help them protect the hives. Closed the top entrances. Reopened two days later, but left the entrance reducers. 
um, and they're worried. They're all active, but there's a lot of dead on the ground and worried about the mortality. It's just, it says any thoughts. Um, I would just like to offer condolences. That sounds very traumatic. Um, I th it is, you know, it is late in the season, but it's also early enough that, um, you know, you can see what happens. Thankfully, the robbers are generally the oldest bees, you know, so that those are going to be those summer bees that are going to, to die off anyway. And hopefully, even though it can look very traumatic, hopefully you were able to stop it um, and see. But you should have a couple of weeks, depending where you are, I guess, in the state or the country to, to figure that out. I don't know if Dan, you want to add to that. Or just one one thing that's challenging there is is you you've just put if you've just put formic on, which you want you don't like you don't want to confine the entrance of the hive when you put formic on. But what do you want to do when you have robbing? You want to confine the entrance of the hive um, to you know minimize the defendable area or space. Um, one thing you could, you know, hindsight, learning experience and all that, but like hardware cloth or something like that, that allows you to basically close an entrance to robbers and bee access, but not impede the ventilation. That's a, you know, but I get these things happen all of a sudden and you, you know, it, you do the best you can, but if you're just kind of thinking through future options, um, yeah, that's tough when you get two things kind of counter- counter to each other as, as far as what would what would fix them or help and not saying that this is what you did but one of the things that um is on the label for formic and that we have to educate a lot is you want to make sure like when you're putting the formic on that that's all you're doing um so you're not doing a big inspection or you're not taking honey off at the same time um and if you you know sometimes it's nice to go out with two people because if you can just like open the two boxes like a clamshell, quick throw them on and close it really fast. Um, that can also reduce the chances that you would induce robbing um, while you're doing a treatment. All right, so Anna, the goldenrod is just coming out now and the bees are all over it. <laughs> and I can smell it in my eyes. Shouldn't I wait for goldenrod to start drying off for my last honey harvest? I'd say this is a lot of personal preference. So and Dan and I have some yards that are not that far from each other. We've learned from the past few years, we have a yard. It's just in a field of goldenrod. There's so much goldenrod, but for some reason, I don't know if it's the type of goldenrod or what's going on, but the bees never seem to make very much in term in the late summer or fall in that yard. So we've already pulled all our honey supers from that yard and we are feeding as needed. Whereas in other yards that are not too far away, we know that our bees historically can do really well on goldenrod. And so we're leaving those honey supers on and we're going to see if we do get a nice fall flow there and we're waiting. So it depends a lot on where you are in the state and kind of what nectar sources you have. It also kind of depends on your personal management strategies. And um, another thing we're also thinking about is how much weight we have in those brood boxes. So we want to make sure that if those brood boxes are feeling pretty light, that we pull honey sooner rather than later. So we have more time for feeding syrup. And I, yeah, there are some people that totally wait till goldenrod's in and then they feed. Um, someone told me once, they're like, that's not goldenrod honey. That's fool's goldenrod honey if you try to take it. But I also know that there's a lot of people that would rather wait and take it. Um, so it's just, a, would you rather feed or use that as your last food? Um, still on robbing and feeding, I put extracted frames on a hive that set off a robbing scene. Just scary. I used water wet towels to slow it down. How safe is it to return extracted frames to a needy hive without starting robbing? Anna, do you want to keep going on that? I think if you're doing... um. So, you know, the colonies that are vulnerable to robbing are normally going to be the ones that are weak or small in population or sick or not clean, right? Or hives that are open for a long time or not even that long. But if you have a hive open and then robber bees in the area find that exposed honey. But if you um, want to add extractive supers back on top of a hive, I would make sure that the box, it's like wipe down the sides of the box so that they're not sticky with honey and just be really quick about it and put them on strong colonies with that are clean, right? That's, I'm assuming they're thinking just like above an inner cover to get the supers dried out. I, I think that's it, yeah, of having them above an inner cover and not just putting them outside. 
Um, so, and then still kind of on the same thought, but it's worded differently. So I think it's worth it. Can I feed at the same time? The bees are bringing in fall nectar. Will that throw off my goldenrod honey? Oh, know, yeah, specific. sure. So if you are planning on extracting it for humans, you don't want to feed syrup at the same time. Otherwise, you're just going to have honey that is adulterated with sugar syrup in it. Um, but if you've already pulled all the honey that you plan to extract for humans, you can definitely feed syrup while your bees are also collecting um, nectar from goldenrod if that all that nectar and syrup is just going into the brood nest area. Um, all right, so there's one hive that has two deep boxes and both are 70 to 80% full. Can we put on another box or is it too late? Anna, you can keep going. You're on a roll at these. Okay. I would say it is basically too late. At this point, if you give your bees foundation, it's um, unlikely that they're going to draw out very much and they might be, they're either going to be very slow or not draw it out at all. Um, if you have something like foundation, so the boxes that are 70 to 80% full, you if you have drawn cone, you could replace those empty foundation frames um, and just make sure that the boxes are full, but I would not expect a colony to fill up a new box this time of year. And I think this, for me, this time of year and that question in specific is the reason why I think like beekeeping takes so much experience. Like that is one of the things that like you just have to watch at this time of year to know putting boxes on. Um, all right, we're, we're past 8.30, but there's still some nice questions on there. I see some people have dropped off, but I'm fine that we just keep going till they're done. Sure. Um, so there is a study, someone pointed out that there is a study that exists that shows a 22% increase in winter survival for wrapped hives in, in Illinois. And um, I, that I'm aware of this because every single time I say that you don't have to wrap, um, someone brings this up. Yes, in one, so in this study, it's a small study, they compared two locations, and the unwrapped colonies, they were having, I think it was above 20%, I think it was like 27% losses. So if I had 27% losses, I would probably be looking at other strategies. Um, but at our bees at MSU, this last year, we lost, you know, one hive per yard, basically, or we had very good survival. Um, my colonies the last few years, I'm not anywhere near losing 27%. So um, there is also a study from 1968 in Wisconsin where they overwintered colonies just in screens and not even in boxes at all, let alone um, wintered ones. So, which is again, not a recommendation, but if it is something that in my experience, I try to figure out what is the absolute minimum that I can spend on them that doesn't result in a, something lowered to their health. Um, but I'm not against label or wrapping them per se. What I've found is that people lose really high numbers of bees to varroa mites and not having enough food. And the first thing they do is wrap their colony and then they put a quilt box and they do an entrance reducer and that kind of stuff. So I'm not saying that it can't help, but if you're in that rate where you're losing 30 to 50 to 100% of your colonies, I would look at the animal before I look at the hive. Um, but I like, I love it when people respond with studies. That's my favorite kind of conversation. Um, when do you start combining to take your losses of weak colonies? Dan, do you want to talk about if you've done that? Yeah. Um, if all I did was look after my own bees all the time. Um, probably would have done that a couple of weeks ago, but reality is it's probably going to happen this coming week. Um, yeah, I, I think this, this time it's it's getting a little later than I would like, but again, we're you know, <clears throat> early September. The bees still have um, a good amount of time to, you know, kind of naturally contract um you know fill out their brood boxes whether again whether that's nectar coming in or i'm going to give them the feed um but yeah i'll this you know next lap around is going to be queen right checks and everything basically i've been you know just adding supers and pulling supers the last couple of months there's not been a lot of real work down in the brood nest now that we're getting to supers off or you know the last supers on is the time where it's like all right we need to get stuff who's who 
If I need to do any combines, I made some small splits in July that are kind of my replacement stock. So if I have some queen issues, I've got, you know, colonies I can newspaper combine. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we're in that window. You know, I would say, you know, ideally that happens in August, but reality is going to happen in se- first of September this year. So be it. Darn jobs getting away mm-hmm. with beekeeping. I tell you what. Um yeah, I, I feel the same. I usually try to have them all combined by the time Goldenrod starts, um, but that's basically now-ish, um, but it's still fine. All right, so should I remove all the honey or all the supers and take all of the honey from them, But or will the bees go up for honey if I leave a super on over winter? And I feel like you're killing it on these uh, hive arrangement ones, so. Great. Yeah, it's a great question. I would say it kind of depends on your hive configuration. But for example, one thing that's really common here in Michigan is you have two deep boxes or the equivalent in mediums. And those are the boxes that you leave year round and they have brood, you know, in the spring, summer, fall, and then lots of honey for winter. Um, And then you remove all of your honey supers for human consumption and you just kind of keep those boxes separate. There are beekeepers for some reason or another If you think that your bees just don't have enough honey at all, you could leave an extra super of honey on the bees for winter. They will, you know, use that honey, but we just like to then mark those boxes. So we know that now we're considering that super to be a a brood box and not a honey super intended for humans. Um, Is honey bee healthy beneficial as a food supplement? Dan or Zachary, do you have experience with that? I I don't. Okay. I've so I have used it as a not a food supplement that is like super beneficial. I've used it as an attractant. So if you want to put if you want to put it in the feed, like so in that you add it to the sugar water and you add just a tiny amount and it attracts the bees to the sugar water so it can allow them to take it in more quickly. I mean, I think it's just because they find it. It also has the benefit of kind of keeping the sugar water from, you know, clouding or having some bacterial and yeast growth. Um, But that's as far as I would make the claims is about it being beneficial. Um, With all of those supplements, they are not regulated in the claims that they make. And so um, I would not say that it does anything besides attracting the bees to the sugar water. But that means that I do often use it, but just for that purpose alone, just to kind of increase the speed that they take it down. Um, Any special needs for overwintering a nuke? I can talk to that. Um, I have Lots of nukes that I overwinter. Some years that I have had much better success than large colonies or equal success. Some years I have lost more of the nukes. And when that's the case, it's generally a starvation issue. And it's generally because I'm not in there as quick. Um, And that's because they're just smaller. So they have less food in there. So I would say the one thing is you just have to watch them more closely for the amount of food. But I make them up in all sorts of different sizes of equipment. And I haven't found a strong argument for something being, you know, much, much better than, than anything else. And I do have a document somewhere. I can see if I can put it in the chat, if I stop talking um, about comparing the the different styles, but um, I, I originally got a stair grant for the purpose of looking to see if I could find a nice system for overwintering nukes. And basically I found like 15 systems that all worked perfectly fine. Um, So I ended up kind of not having a great thing because it just, it was so easy for me to at least get a bunch of extra small hives through the winter without an enormous amount of work that it just always felt useful to just try some. And a lot of times the trying them worked pretty well. Um, Someone stated they had Formic Pro triggered supersedures. Um, That's something we do hear a lot. I personally have not had that much supersedure using Formic Pro, both at MSU and at my own yards. But I don't know if Dan or Anna or Zach, or if you want to talk about supersedures past Formic Pro or what your experience has been. We've had some, um, but not, not to the point where Formic Pro is still my 
not our primary mite treatment. Um, you know, it's a, it's a small percentage. We drop a few occasionally, but you know, Queens fizzle out occasionally just on their own. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm aware of, it. I know beekeepers are concerned about it. Um, I do hear a fair amount of it and say we've experienced it, but not to the point I consider a huge problem, but we also watch the temperature pretty closely when we're putting it on. I, th I think if you're up near the the top end of that temperature range or, you know, if you're up into the, you know, pushing 85, um, I think that's probably can be, you know, where, we, where you'd be potentially more problematic. So we shoot for high seventies, but you know, 80, 82, maybe the, the particularly like the first three days. Um, that's, that's ideally what we're looking for when we use Formic Pro and we put it on um, almost always as a two pads at once. I see there's the question about that coming to, um, the two pads, 14 day treatment rather than one pad. And then coming back 10 days later for another pad, um, couple thoughts of it just cause that follow up question. Um, one, I never know what that, when that weather is going to be 10 days from now. And so if I put it on, if I put one on and I basically committed to putting another on in 10 days and have no control over what that temperature is going to be or what is going to happen in my life. And am I going to be available to go do it and all that? Um, so I, I think the idea is with the two pads at once, you're getting enough of a dose that you are in theory killing mites underneath the capping versus the putting one on, you're just killing mites on adult bees. And then 10 days later, you're kind of halfway through the brood cycle. So as there's been a hatch out of new mites, you're killing more mites on adult bees. That, that's kind of the idea if I understand it correctly, but my experience has been large, almost exclusively with the two pads at once. Is it too late now to use to use uh, Formic Pro if I use it tomorrow? Is it too late? Dad? We were discussing that because I think for us, the heat changes on Saturday Sunday. Or Sunday, it's getting warm. So it's right on the level. So it, it says you don't want it, you know, like within the first week, but there is, so when we worked with that group at the um, MSU researchers in Midland that are doing the polymer, they looked at, actually they took the formic and looked at how quickly the formic leaves the pad. And most of it leaves the pad in the first couple of days. So like there is a pretty strong curve. So I would, I would definitely be concerned about the first like three or four days for sure. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And it and it also depends too on how long it's above 85 degrees. You know, if it dips above 85, but then it's much cooler the whole rest of the day, that's different than you know yeah. those times where in August where it's like hot all day, hot all night, and it's constantly giving off the formic. Hmm. Um, um Anna, how do you combine a weak hive with a strong hive? If they've got three hives next to each other, one of them seems weak. Um, it's just much lighter. Cap brood is sparse. Great. So one of my favorite ways to combine hives, especially this time of year, is just using a sheet of newspaper. So normally I find the colony that's strongest and that's queen rate, and I put a single sheet of newspaper over it, and then I add the queenless or weaker hives on top of it. Um, I'll sometimes just rip the newspaper a little bit to help the bees get started, but the idea is that the bees will clean out the newspaper, but while they're, it gives them some time to get used to each other's scent to reduce the amount of fighting. Um, if you know which queen you want to come out, sometimes it's better to pinch, you can pinch the queen or remove the queen from the weaker colonies, or you can just hope that that's, um, if there's a big difference in colony size, I'd kind of expect that the colony with the stronger queen is the one that makes it. Um, but really the newspaper combination is one of my favorite ways to combine co colonies this time of year. But you have to kill the smaller colonies queen, right? I've heard of bees. I normally do. I normally remove the smaller one, but I know there's beekeepers who don't. They let the bees work it out and sometimes that works out too. <laughs> All right. There's a question about if you left your honey supers on, does that risk condensation on the frames and then the water would drip onto the brood? Um, so that having the honey supers on will increase condensation in the colony. But the, the issue is really having the bees 
move up into um the honey supers and then now they become brood frames for the whole rest of your life and there's a question about like what's bad about using brood frames for honey and really what you want is to make sure you're keeping them separate for a couple reasons and the big one is just for feeding you know if you're feeding them sugar water at any point you want to make sure that you're not selling humans very expensive sugar water um, or if you're using a medication or things like that, it's also just nice to keep track to make sure that you are leaving a sufficient amount for the hives. All right. So I want to thank Matt, who mixed his missed his dog being the star. So he'll have to watch the recording to see her big moment, um, who gave me the ch uh, links to put in the chat. We've got one last question about invert sugar to feed. Um, so when I was talking about sucrose, um, being sugar, the um, sucrose sugar is like the basic one that you get from the store. Sucrose is made up of glucose and fructose, which are the simple sugars. Sucrose is a disaccharide, so you can invert it by breaking the disaccharide down into the simple sugars. Um, so it tastes much sweeter, and then it's technically easier to digest because there's nothing to break down. Um, so one of the things is nectar has a combination of sucrose, glucose, and fructose in it. So bees are 100% able to digest sucrose. And in fact, their hypopharyngeal glands produces an enzyme called invertase, which the purpose of is to break down sucrose. So there's nothing wrong about feeding them sucrose. Um, when you do cook two to one syrup, you do tend to make you break down some of the sugars. So you will have a combination of the um, glucose and fructose in there. Um, there are a lot of people that talk about doing it on purpose and trying to break it down for it's easier to digest. In my opinion, it's not worth the effort. And again, you can start making other things when you start messing with sugars. Um, I did, when I lived in Sweden, you actually could purchase um, feeds that were a combination of sucrose, fructose, and glucose. Of course, it was, of course, it was easy and efficient because it's Scandinavia. It was also incredibly expensive too. Um, so there are options that you can do things like that, but um, I've never noticed it being worth the extra um, effort. All right, I don't know if anyone else has ever dealt with that before. I, when I first read that question, I thought it, he was referring to inverted corn syrup, high fructose corn well, syrup, which some could... people some people refer to as inverted syrup. So the if if that's the question, then the answer is no, it's bad for you. I saw I had a high school student doing studies in my lab, uh, trying to compare white sugar, honey, and corn syrup. So one thing that's clear is the corn syrup is the worst. One thing that's confusing is that uh, white sugar is better than honey. We're still trying to trying to figure out why that's the case. And so that's the second study. One earlier published study by USDA lab in the 70s said the same thing, that bees lived longer. In the cage studies, bees lived longer if they're fed with white sugar. So it's ec ecological, evolutionary, it doesn't make much sense because you would think the bees should have found out after a few millions of years, should have figured out which one's best for them. Now we're saying, hey, white sugar is better. <laughs> so it's probably just because the lab, the, it's a lab study and uh, might be some something with it uh, that made the honey not as good. For example, we have to dilute the honey. So one thing that occurred to me one day suddenly was, oh, what happened is, what happens if the yeast in the honey that's making the honey into a honey wine, killing, them, killing my bees? So I added some yeast inhibitor that didn't help. So, so that goes on my pet dairy. So now you guys need to uh, give me more ideas why, how to explain white sugar is better than honey. Which which can't be true. So I know <laughs> I don't trust myself. So I trust the bees more. Yeah. But I have to explain the data. So. <laughs> I like I trust the bees more, but we still have to explain ourselves as scientists. 
<laughs> that is, that is such a true statement. Um, so we made it through all the questions. I'm so pleased to see how many people either forgot to turn off their webinars or stuck with us for the questions. Um, I'm wishing everybody a super, super happy and heavy golden rod flow. And may the asters be blooming long into August or October. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great um, couple of weeks till we see you next. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.